Good morning, Amy Jacobson here with Paul Vallis, who's in for Dan Prof today. Are you having fun, Paul? I am. Isn't it early it to is get up early? early. It's very early. I, I messaged you to give me a wake-up call. I was, oh. afraid, I was afraid I was going to sleep through my alarm. You I didn't give me a wake-up call. I completely forgot. But I didn't. I woke up, and I got out, and I snuck out. And <laughs> Quiet I didn't wake enough up my so you... 93-year-old mother. Or for... your wife. <laughs> or my wife. <laughs> Hope you're sleeping with your wife, not your mother. <laughs> well, well, actually, she's on the... We'll never have sex again. Shift what at the uh, at the uh, uh, at the uh, uh, TSA. Yeah, at TSA. So, which means she goes to work at about like mid. She goes to work at like one in the morning or two in the morning. Really? And she gets home. Yes. And how is it a full time job or part time job? It's all the TSA slots are are, are part time jobs. Oh, they are. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. So I said maybe she's trying to send me a message. Yeah. She's like, <laughs> so she starts work at one a.m. Yeah, yeah. Gets she gets up at... and she's off. She's on her way. She's on her way home now. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, how many days a week does she do that? She does five days a week. Five. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So she's gone. So yeah, I hear that she sneaks out. It the garage door opens. She's on her way, and and then she, and she likes she, that shift. Yeah, she she picked it. Really doesn't say much about me, does it? <laughs> I'd be very concerned if I were you. All so right. anyway, yeah, she likes it. So thanks for coming in. And uh, as you know, uh, this hot topic has been the transgender issue and leah thomas winning the 500 yard freestyle even though leah thomas is still technically a man and not a woman leah how did that performance measure up to your expectations coming into this meet tonight i i didn't have a whole lot of expectations for this meet i was just happy to be here trying to race and compete as best as i could you've undoubtedly been under the spotlight over the past few months how have you been dealing with that and reasoning with everything I try to ignore it as much as I can. I try to focus on my swimming, uh, what I need to do to get ready for my races, and just try to block out everything else. What did that race mean to you? It's, it means the world to, to be here, be with two of my best friends and teammates, and be able to compete. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you so much. And it's, I mean, it's just, it tears your soul apart because you know that he took a, a spot away from a woman who has spent her whole life t- training hours, months, days, years in the pool, trying to, you know, get in and to qualify for the NCAA championship with more on this. Let's welcome to the program. I have the pronunciation of your name right here. Lee or Sapphire. I hope I didn't get that wrong or right. Right. I hope I got that right. Excuse me. And he joins us on our turnkey pro answer line. Good morning, Lee or how are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me on your show. Close enough to pronunciation. Well, what is the pronunciation? Sapir? Yeah, Sapir, yes. Sapir. Mm-hmm. See? I just got the syllables all right. Um, and he's <laughs> adjunct fellow at Manhattan Institute. And the column is Transgender Confusions. And he also wrote a column about what Leah Thomas means. So what does Leah Thomas mean, especially for the future of women's sports? Well, I think that remains to be determined. Um I think what we're beginning to see right now is uh, a significant backlash uh, against uh, participation in women's sports by transgender women. Um, and that, that backlash, I think, is, is on the whole a very good thing um, because it's, it's correcting false assumptions, skewed assumptions about what the science says about athletic advantage um, and policies that were really put in place by activists with very little public input. Um, you know, the, the backlash could go overboard and could go too far in the opposite direction. But but for now, I think it's, it's heading in the right direction. We've seen the NCAA delegate the responsibility for um, revamping transgender policies to the individual uh, athletic conferences, which uh, could be a good thing. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, in general, Leah Thomas's participation in the swimming championships um, was a a blow to transgender activists who are trying to get our public institutions to redefine what it means to be male or female. Because Leah Thomas, I mean, I don't know what his male name was, but he was on the swim team, on the men's swim team for three years, correct? Before transitioning over to the women's team? Right, right. Uh, So what, I mean, are there, do you think, because the Olympics are coming up, the summer games, well, it's 2024 that we're going to have them in Paris. Do you think it's a possibility that he could be on the women's Olympic team? Uh, sure, it's possible. Yeah, let me ask you something. You know, look, the, the issue, and clearly you need to have rules and guidelines aside because right. this is a, a legitimate issue, and, and, and it's not 
you know, it, you know, it, it's uh, it, it's not a d- denial of transgender rights, but there are legitimate issues when it comes to sports competitions. But how widespread is this? Because, you know, sometimes you get like one or two or three isolated cases and it gets national attention. And, and, but what a per- and, and yeah, what percentage yeah, of the population yeah, is yeah, transgender? I, you know, I'm, I, I, I mean, how many sport? And, and I'm not I'm not saying that that you shouldn't have rules and regulations and guidelines. You do. And you need to have this debate and have this discussion because you need to make sure that that uh, uh, people are not uh, competing unfairly. But I mean, what are we talking about? A half a dozen cases, a dozen cases. I mean, it's a big country. You know, or, you know even on the Olympic team, what are we talking about? One slot, two slots. I'm just trying to get perspective on this. Well, I think the, the basic answer is we don't know. Um, we, we don't know how many transgender um, girls and women are competing in the um, female category of sports. Uh, almost by definition, we only hear about it when um, incidents like these happen. Yeah. Uh, Leah Thomas. There were other cases across the country. Um, there is a, an ongoing lawsuit in Connecticut, for example. Um, between 2017 and 2020, um, uh, two transgender uh, runners um, ran ran in and won uh, a little more than a dozen state competitions, and um, a number of uh, non-transgender girls have filed a lawsuit claiming that this violates their right to equal athletic opportunity and education under Title IX. So that lawsuit is ongoing, but that's a good example of how, um, you know, when transgender girls and women compete and win, uh, it, it it creates headlines um, when they compete and don't win, which does happen, um, it usually doesn't. Now, I should point out one more thing, which is that like most other issues in the United States, um, this issue has gone to the federal courts Mm -hmm. um, almost immediately after it came up. Um, And the way in which courts have dealt with transgender issues, I think, is really suboptimal. Courts are very poorly equipped to uh, evaluate scientific medical debate. Um, they tend to uh, they they tend to get um, bogged up in abstractions and extreme cases, and it's very difficult for judges to see uh, soberly and clearly what kinds of policies should govern our our public life. And I think this case is no uh, is, is no exception. So one thing I point out, for example, in my piece in City Journal, is that uh, you know Republican states have passed laws trying to um, ban transgender women from women's sports. The problem with these laws is that they categorically, well, it's not a problem, but, but it, it, it sets up a problem, is that they categorically ban transgender women from women's sports. Now, why is that a problem? Because it allows advocacy organizations like the ACLU to find even one single transgender um, girl or woman who has not dominated in her category of sports and to argue before a federal judge that, hey, look, you know, this this ban is overly broad because clearly this in this particular case, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't compromise athletic opportunity for for non non transgender girls. and women. Well, and this all started, I mean, remember the bathroom bill in 2016 and Attorney General Loretta Lynch at the time, like in North Carolina's bathroom bill to the dark days of Jim Crow. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that comparison is just ridiculous on its face. I mean, if if that were really the case, then the solution would be to eliminate sex segregation in bathrooms, right? The the solution to Jim Crow was not to have uh, bathrooms segregated by race in which whites and blacks could could, uh, use whichever bathroom happened to accord with their internal sense of whiteness or blackness. It was to eliminate racial uh, segregation as such. Um, but of course, it's telling, it's revealing that that the Obama administration did not put pressure on schools to eliminate sex segregation. All it said was that students have to be allowed, or or adults in the case of, um, or the general population in the case of North Carolina, that people ought to be able to use the bathrooms that accord with their internal sense of gender. So the comparison to Jim Crow is clearly calculated to appeal to judges. Um, it, it bears no relation to the to any kind of sober analysis of what's what's going on here. Now, let's talk about gender dysphoria in youth. It, I, I'm old enough to remember when if you wanted to, to become, you know, a pers- a, of the opposite sex, you had to go through a year of counseling before they would put you under the knife. What What are the rules today? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure there are rules, and that's part of the problem. 
Um, one way in which the United States has really become an outlier when it comes to pediatric gender transition medicine um, is that we are a highly decentralized country with a highly decentralized medical establishment. And that means that having uniformity um, across states and clinics is quite difficult. Mm. Um, but let me say one thing, which I think is really fundamental here. As you pointed out, the norm used to be that, you know, people uh, who would undergo gender transition surgeries or hormone therapy would have to go through extensive psychological vetting right. to make sure that the gender distress was really the source of their agony and that the transitions which have, can have irreversible consequences would actually do them good. Um, until the 90s, this was done only in adults. And since the 90s, it's been done increasingly in children as well. But here's the crucial part. In the United States, the, the norms, the rules, the regulations of medicine have been totally subordinated to the argument by the transgender movement that transgender identity is as normal and as healthy as non-transgender identity. Now, why is that important? For the very simple reason that if you accept that premise, any form of psychological vetting presupposes that all things considered, it's better for a child or a teenager to end up being not transgender than being transgender. So if, we're, if activist groups are pushing to normalize transgender identity and make it um, just as, as common and natural as any other um, identity, that is, by, by definition, that, that is going to um, put an enormous amount of pressure on, on the medical establishments to not do proper psychological vetting of minors and teenagers. And that's, I think, why you're, starting, why you're seeing um, more and more stories come out of uh, young adults, especially young women, who were wrongly transitioned and claimed that they did not go through proper psychological vetting or, for that matter, any psychological vetting. All right, we're going to have to leave it there today. The articles can both uh, be found at City Journal. Dot org. He is Lior Safir. Safir, excuse me, I got it right this time. Adjunct fellow at Manhattan Institute. And thank you so much, Lior, for joining us. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Connect with Dan and Amy using the A.